Let's all open up in our Bibles to the book of Genesis, chapter 14. You know, and as you do that, you got to love that intro music, don't you? <laughs> Amen. I'm just back there. I'm just like, yeah, yeah. And I'm just thinking, I'm like, you know, I talk fast naturally. And when they're kind of coming in with that heavy bass, I'm like, man, I could teach like five chapters in a night with that kind of rhythm. <laughs> you guys would be like, hold on, Pastor Daniel, hold on. <laughs> Genesis chapter 14. Now, as always, as we do here on Thursday nights, there's a number that's going to be popping up on the screen. You can text in your questions. I'll take them at the end of service. We want, I try my best to try and cover everything, but... You know, sometimes you just miss something. You don't explain something properly. So we want to make sure that everyone feels comfortable with what they've heard. There's some questions. And all the questions that we get are good questions. And so we do want you to text them in also. If you're, uh, if you're on Twitter and Facebook and stuff, you can, uh, you can put in things. and You can hashtag it. You can do all that stuff if you know what I'm talking about. So uh, we want this to be a, a, a multi-sensory experience for you as well as hearing the word. So we want you to uh, do that. So, but do take your cell phones and put them on vibrate so that I don't get to hear your cool ringtones while we're teaching. So Genesis chapter 14. Now, this patriarch series, we're looking at the life of right now Abram, who is going to be renamed Abraham, and we're going to see that next week. But it's interesting. God called Abraham. He told him to get on the road to leave his family and that God was going to bless him and that God was going to give him a... Uh, a land to live in, and God was going to make him a great nation. And if you were tracking along with us the last, last week, you found that right away there's a famine in the land he goes to, and he ends up in Egypt. And then all of a sudden, him and his nephew Lot and their herdsmen are, are disputing over wells and lands, and there's conflict. And now this week, we're going to find that his nephew Lot is going to be taken into captivity, and Abram's got to go get him. And I wanted to start with this because so often we have this idea that like God has called me and now my life is going to be like the eternal slip and slide in Jesus. Woo! You know what I mean? Where it's just like God's called me, he sent me in a direction and everything is just going to be so easy and great and there's going to be no issues. And the problem with that mentality is, is that the Bible just never says that. Jesus said in John 16, in this world you will have tribulation, but what? But be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. And the reality is Jesus doesn't promise us ease, ease and comfort and no issues in following him. What he promises is that no matter what befalls us, if we're following him, he'll be with us. And Abram is just another in a long line of biblical examples of somebody who God has called and God said, look, I want you to head in this direction. And then everything starts to go wrong almost right away. So following Jesus means following Jesus. It doesn't mean that Jesus is going to take you on the easiest path. Okay? So in a lot of ways, I mean, Robert Frost, I mean, one of the great poets in American history, talked about the road less traveled. And following Jesus is that road. Don't think if you're following him that everything's just going to be super easy. Oftentimes, things get more complicated. But following Jesus is not in the easy outcome. It's in the details of going in and out of all these situations and having them be complicated sometimes. So Abram, he ends up in Egypt. His wife ends up in Pharaoh's court. Oh no, maybe there won't be uh, an offspring for Abram. But God works that out. Then there's the issue with Lot, and, and Abram says, hey, listen, Lot, you choose. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right, but let's be at peace. Maybe God's promise of the land is going to be thwarted, but Abram chooses to go towards Sodom. He leaves the land of Canaan for Abram. Problem solved. Chapter 14, in verse 1, look at what it says. And it came to pass in the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar, area king of Elisar, Chedalamar, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of nations, that they made war with Bera, king of Sodom, Bersha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Adma, Shemaber, king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zoar, 
they all join together in the valley of Shittim. And that's what it says in there, so don't worry. That is the Salt Sea. Twelve years later, they served Chedorlaomer, And in the 13th year, they rebelled. In the 14th year, Chedorlaomer and the kings were attacked with him, came and attacked the Rephaim in Ashtaroth, Karnaim, the Zuzim in Ham, and the Emim in Shavath Kirathaim, and the Horites in the mountains of Seir, as far as El Paran, which is by the wilderness. Then they turned back and came to En Mishpat, that is Kadesh, and attacked the country of the Amalekites, and also the Amorites who dwelt in Hazazan Tamar. And the king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah, the king of Adama, the king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zoar, went out and joined together in battle in the valley of Shittim. Against Chedorlaomer, king of Elam, Tidal, king of nations, Amraphel, king of Shinar, and Ariok, king of Elisar, four kings against five. Now, the valley of Shittim was full of asphalt pits, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled. Some fell there, and the remainder, remainder fled to the mountains. Then they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their provisions and went their way. They also took Lot, Abram's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom and his goods, and departed. Now, this is a lot of information, and, and really to break it down, what you have is you have the eastern kings, and then you have the Jordanian kings, right? And there's a war. That's pretty much what happens. Okay, you have the eastern kings like Amraphel, king of Shinar, which is in modern-day Babylon, uh, Arioch of Elisar, Chedorlaomer of Elam, which is east of Shinar, and then Tidal, who is the king of the Goyim, which is the king of the nations. And so you have these eastern kings, and then there's a war against the Jordanian kings, which was Bera, the king of Sodom, and Bersha, the king of Gomorrah, uh, Sinab, the king of Adamar, and, and all this. And pretty much what they're explaining in these verses is that there are two federations. The eastern kings, which were led by Chedorlaomer, and then there was a rebellion. It would seem that Chedorlaomer was the, the kind of the head guy in this federation. And then there was a rebellion against this federation by the Jordanian kings, which will include Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, all of this is in here to simply tell us that there was a war. Lot had pitched his tents over there by Sodom, in Sodom. And when in this fray, what ends up happening is his lot gets taken. So there's a lot of details in there. And if you like all the details and place names, again, you could send me an email and I'm happy to give it to you. But I've found that in sermons like this, if I just rattle off this place is here and this place is here and this is this. And by the time it's all a bunch of information. And if I ask you after the service, you'll be like, I don't know what you said. So, but if you like those details, I'm happy to give them to you. Just send me an email. It's really easy to do. All of that is telling us simply this, that Lot, in this war between these two federations, Sodom and Gomorrah, that area gets conquered by the federal federations of Chedorlaomer. They all flee. Some flee to the mountains, some get taken, and Lot ends up with them. Okay? Now, from there, you get this. Verse 13, then one who had escaped came and told Abram, the Hebrew, for he dwelt by the terebinth trees of Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Eskol, the brother of Aner, and they were allies with Abram. Now, when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his 318 trained servants who were born in his own house and went in pursuit as far as Dan. He divided the forces against them by night, and he and his servants attacked them and pursued them as far as Hobah, which is north of Damascus. So he brought back all the goods, and he also brought back his brother Lot and his goods, as well as the women and the people. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him in the valley of Sheva, that is, the king's valley, after his return from the defeat of Chedorlaomer and the king's who were with him. Wow. So imagine this. Lot gets taken. The eastern, the Jordanian king, Sodom, Gomorrah, and these other nations, they end up in captivity or in exile. They're fleeing to the mountains. And one guy gets away and comes to this man. Now notice he's characterized here as Abram the Hebrew. That's the first time you get that in the Bible. 
Abram the Hebrew. Now, remember when we were going through the earlier chapters, we saw that man named Eber, which is where the word Hebrews comes from. Because if you think about it, and you, we don't, you wouldn't know this unless you studied Hebrew. And if you haven't studied Hebrew, I encourage you to. It's a fun language. The, the H, which is a hey, that is the definite article. So like we would say like the king. It would be an H prefixed on to the word king, which is the Hebrew word melech. So Hebrew is the Eber. Hebrew. It means the descendant of Eber who is in that royal line. First time he's used, called this here, Abram the Hebrew. Now notice what happens. He comes and he tells Abram the Hebrew, he's dwelling by the terebinth trees of Mamre. And we get a couple details about this. And as I said last week, the terebinth trees of Mamre, this is, became maybe the center place of the end of the book of Genesis with each of the patriarchs dwelling there for a time. So the terebinth trees of Mamre, that's that location. Now, it's interesting what happens. Verse 14. Now, when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his 318 trained servants who were born in his own house and went in pursuit as far as Dan. Now, I wanted to stop here, and I wanted to make a point, because if you're here on Sunday, if you weren't, you should check it out online. We talked about how Jesus said, if someone slaps you on the right cheek, turn and give him your left also. Right? And I made a strong point that Jesus is not saying if somebody is harming you physically because the, the slap on the right cheek with a predominantly right-handed uh, humanity was the highest of insults. Jesus isn't talking about receiving physical punishment. He's re talking about being insulted. And he's saying that when you are insulted, you should be generous instead of returning insults. Right? But a lot of times people take that verse and they say, Jesus believes in pure pacifism. Which means that if somebody comes to attack you, to hurt your family, that you're just supposed to let them do it. Right? And a lot of people would use that verse in Matthew chapter 5 to, to make that case. But as I told you, that's not about receiving physical harm. It's about receiving insults, being insulted, being maligned. Now here we get Abram, who we know is the great patriarch, who is in fact... You know, the, the father of monotheistic religion, when he finds out his son Lot has been taken captive by arms, he gets his 318 servants and he arms them to go. So the question is, is what should a Christian's position on violence be? War. And I think the Apostle Paul says it the most succinctly. Romans chapter 12, verse 18. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. I love that. If it is possible and as much as depends on you. What that means is that as Christians, we should be radical peacemakers. Ra and I say radical to the point where we should exhaust every single possibility to settle things peaceably. And at the point when it is inevitable, then I do not believe it honors Jesus for us to roll over and do nothing. So if somebody entered my home to hurt my family, I would do everything within my power to defuse the situation. And if the situation, if there was no way to defuse it, then I'm going to protect my family in the name of Jesus. So what that teaches, it, what it teaches that I believe from the Bible that as a Christian, we should be radical peacemakers until it's absolutely impossible to, for a peaceful resolution. And then we should be most humane in bearing arms. Most humane. We, we should never have excessive violence, never uh, retribution-founded violence, just enough to calm a situation down. I believe that's very, very biblical. And if you look at all these different places, I mean, Jesus told us those who live by the sword will die by the sword. Remember Peter cut off Malchus's ear trying to protect Jesus and Jesus healed him? So we want to be radical peacemakers as much as, as within us. And what I have found is that God's bandwidth for peacemaking is much greater than even mine is. Where I think peacemaking ends, oftentimes God says, no, no, no. There's, there's more long suffering to be done. Does that make sense? Because Abram here, godly man, 
We're going to meet Abram in heaven. He died believing in God's promise of Messiah. He didn't know his name was Jesus at that time. Abram, we're going to meet Abram in heaven. And Abram, when he found out his nephew Lot had been taken captive, grabbed his 318 soldiers and went on out to go find him. And I believe that's very honorable. Now, what's interesting here, notice this, because you know what happens. He, Abram goes on out, he attacks them, and he wins. And it's fascinating that Abram with the Lord and 318 men could do what five kings without the Lord couldn't do. Do you see that? Abram with 318 men and the Lord on his side did what five kings and their armies could not do without the Lord. My pastor used to always say, Daniel, you and the Lord in any crowd is a majority. And I think that's important for us to remember that if the Lord is on our side, then it's all going to be okay. That you and the Lord in any crowd is a majority. So it's interesting. What happens now is Abram goes, he defeats these kings of the east. Look what it says in verse 16. So he brought back all the goods and also brought back his brother Lot and his goods as well as the women and the people. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Sheva, that is the king's valley, after his return from the defeat of Chedorlaomer and the kings who were with him. So Abram is returning with Lot, with all of the people, all of the women, all of the goods, and now the king of Sodom is coming to meet with Abram. But then this story, this narrative gets interrupted. In verse 18, look what it says. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of the Most High. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he gave him a tithe of all. So Abram is returning from battle, victorious. The king of Sodom is coming to meet him. And then this man, Melchizedek, king of Salem, shows up. Now, Melchizedek, the king of Salem, gets a lot of time in the scriptures as well as in the Old and in the New Testament. Why? Because he shows up out of nowhere. The name Melchizedek, it's two Hebrew words slammed together, Melech and Sadek. And if you've ever studied Hebrew, again, now twice in one message, I think it's the Lord trying to tell you guys, study some Hebrew. It's not hard. I mean, I know we're all still working on English, but you know, M Melech means king and Sadek means what? Righteousness. So this man's name means the king of righteousness. Now what's interesting, it says he's the king of Salem or Shalom, which we get the city Jeru Shalom. He is the king of Salem. The word Shalom means peace. So this guy is the king of righteousness. He's the king of peace. And it says also that he is the priest of God Most High. The king of righteousness, the king of peace, the priest of God Most High. What does he have with him? Fascinating. Look what it says. He brought out bread and wine. Elements of communion, bread and wine, communion table. It's fascinating. And what does he do? He blesses Abram. Now, you got to think about this for a second. Think about this. Abram comes back from victory, right? He comes back in victory, and he meets a man whose name means the king of righteousness, who, who's the king of peace, who comes out with bread and wine, who's a priest of God Most High, and he blesses Abraham. The book of Hebrews picks up on this. And you're going to read this. If you read the book of Hebrews all over and over and over again, in Hebrews chapter 7, you read about how Jesus is a priest in the order of Melchizedek. Not part of the Levitical priesthood, 
but part of a priesthood that even predated that. And I love this blessing because look at how he blesses him. He blesses him by saying, blessed be Abram of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. I love this. Who does Abram belong to? God most high. Abram is blessed because of who Abram's God is. That's why Abram's blessed. It has nothing to do with his victory. It has everything to do with who his God is. And I think this is important for us because we do live in 21st century America. There may have never been a more materialistic culture than ours. And most of us have more goods than anybody else in the world, but yet we don't realize that we are the most blessed, not because of the size of our house, not because of how new our car is, not because of how many toys we have, not because of how many channels we have on a, on a plasma screen TV. None of these things actually matter because our blessings come because we are the possession of the God Most High who possesses all of creation. So if you're the kind of person whose glass happens to be half empty more than it is half full, you don't want to fill up that glass with self-help, which is no help at all. You don't want to fill up that glass with positive thinking. You want to fill up that glass with the reality that if you are born again, then you are a child of God. He adopted you by choice, his own choice, into his family, and all of our value— all of our self-valuation comes from that relationship. And this is important because I don't, you know, we live in a self-esteem culture as well. Now, I don't necessarily, I'm not necessarily against wanting to affirm people. But when you tell children, you can do anything, you're actually lying to your kids. Because if I say to Obadiah, Obadiah, you can do anything. And he says, well, I want to have a baby in my womb and deliver it naturally. I said, I mean, I, and I don't expect him to say that, you know, but I, I just set him up for failure. He said, Obadiah, you could do anything you want to do. And he ends up being like me. Five foot six. <laughs> a lot packed into a little body, you know. And I always, I've always wanted to be a center in basketball. Because just the idea of dunking, you know what I mean? Like, I mean... You guys get what that, you know, you see, you see LeBron James, you know, and he has one of those power dunks and I'm just like, yes. And I can only dump on like, dunk on like a five foot net. You know, and I remember I used to play basketball on, on the courtyard with my friends and I had some friends who were pretty good ballers and, and I just wanted to post everybody up like a center, like just bump into them like this, bump in. But I'm like five foot six, you know. And my friends would just laugh because I just thought I was just Shaquille O'Neal, but I was really Spud Webb, you know? And they just, they just wait there, and I turn around and jump, and bang, you know? See, no matter how hard I tried, I'm never going to be an NBA center. God just didn't give me those genes. See, rather than telling our kids you can do anything, the way to truly build self-esteem. It's not self-esteem, it's grace esteem. And we say, listen, I love you and God loves you more. You are my child, but God has adopted you into his family if you believe in Jesus. And listen, you're going to make a million mistakes, but God still loves you. And you're going to have to work hard every single day. You're going to have to say, God, I want to honor you. And some days you're going to fail. And when you fail, you're going to look to the cross and God's going to say, I loved you so much that I died for all your mistakes. And all the times that you do good, God, you're going to look to that cross and God, it's going to say, hey, look, I died on the cross for those mistakes, so don't get proud, son. And that is true. That is true human flourishing in the way we view ourselves. It has nothing to do with how we feel about ourselves. It has everything to do about who God is for us in Christ. And I love because the cross cuts the knees out of self-deprecation or looking down on yourself, having a negative self-image, because if you look down on yourself, God said, look, I loved you enough to send my son to die on a cross. So lighten up on yourself. And if you're really proud, I'm God's gift to the world, you look at the cross and you realize that Jesus died on a cross for your sins. So Jesus cuts the legs out from thinking less of yourself, and he also cuts the leg out of thinking more of yourself than we ought. And we end up in that sweet spot 
with a true self-image that I am gloriously created, loved by God, yet fatally flawed and in need of salvation. That is where human flourishing is found. And what we're seeing right now, now 25, 30 years into the self-esteem culture, is that kids are more miserable than they ever were. Because they've been told that they're wonderful and they look around and they realize that they're just not. You're beautiful, but then you look at someone who's more beautiful. You're smart, and then you meet someone who's smarter. You can do anything, and you realize, I can't do anything. Economics are against me. My own genetics are against me. My own natural giftings are against me. And kids are more miserable now than they've ever been. Maybe it's because we're giving them the wrong type of esteem. Maybe we're teaching them false self-esteem. Instead, we should be teaching them about God, the way God views them. And Abram is blessed. He is blessed because of who his God is. And not only did, not only did Melchizedek bless Abram, but he also blessed the God Most High. I love this. See, it shows Melchizedek standing, in a sense, in the place like Jesus, blessing mankind and blessing God by who he is and how he functions. And if you want to read about Melchizedek, again, write down Hebrews chapter 7. You can spend some time in there. Now, notice what else Abram does in the end of verse 20. And he gave him a tithe of all. Wow. Abram gave Melchizedek a tithe of all. And a tithe literally means a tenth. So of the spoils of war, Abram gives it, gives a tenth of it to Melchizedek. And this is the beginning of the idea of the tithe. Now, I want to say this. The law is God's standard for righteousness. So people say all the time, do you believe in the tithe? And I say, absolutely. And people say, well, the, we're not under the law, we're under, the, under grace. And more often when it comes to giving, people use that because they don't want to give. What I have learned is that people who give never squabble about the percentage. It's only people who don't want to give. Now, you might say, well, but, but we're not under the law, we're under the grace, right? I'm like, I'm sh of course. But if you read 2 Corinthians chapter 9, 2 Corinthians chapter 9 tells us that God loves a cheerful giver, right? Now, know what the problem with that is? This is the problem. Because when you're under grace, why aren't I cheerful in giving everything? See, I'd, if you think about it, you'd rather a percentage given. You'd rather be under the law. Because the law just says, we'll give a tithe and a little bit more. But when you're under grace, God loves a cheerful giver. The question becomes, why aren't I cheerful? And that's the question for each one of us. Because listen, I know what it's like. I was naive enough when I got saved I read in the Bible, you should give a tenth. And so I just got used to doing that in an offering. And so now it's just the way life is for me. But I don't know how many times I go to write that child check. I'm like, Lord, I could really be using that money right now. So I understand what that's like. Believe me. But the reality is, is that God asks us to be cheerful givers. And I always ask myself, Lord, why aren't I cheerful in my giving? And you know, if you ask yourself that question in the presence of the Spirit, you know what you're going to find out? You know why you're not cheerful in your giving? Because you're selfish. And I tell you that from my own experience, okay? So I'm, I'm not trying to be mean or harsh. When I go to the Lord, I'm just like struggling and, I don't, and someone has a need and I can help and I don't want to help. And I say, God, why aren't I a cheerful giver? And God's like, well, you're selfish. That's why. Because you'd rather have extra money in the bank. You'd rather do X, Y, Z. You'd rather go out to dinner one more time. You'd rather get, you know, the, the NFL package. And you can't watch it anyway because you work all day on Sundays. You know what I mean? Like, you know, you'd rather have all these things rather than helping somebody who has a need. And you know what that's called? Selfishness. So the reality is this. God loves a cheerful giver. God so cheerful in his giving, he gave his only begotten son, the most valuable thing to God in the world, the most valuable person he gave up for us. And it's interesting, Abram comes back, he just gives. Gives a tenth to this man, Melchizedek. Now, look what happens in verse 21. It says, Now the king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the persons, or literally the souls, and take the goods for yourself. But... Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand to the Lord God most high, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will take nothing from a thread to a sandal strap, and that I will not take anything that is yours, lest you should say, I have made Abram rich. 
except only what the young men have eaten and the portion of the men who went with me, Aner, Eskol, and Mamre, let them take their portion. Wow. So Abram's got all these goods. The king of Sodom comes and all he wants is the people. That's, now, you guys know Sodom and Gomorrah. Have you heard about it? You know, it, it, it's a type of, of evil, the evil of humanity. It's interesting that the king of Sodom, all he wants is the souls. That's how Satan is. Satan doesn't care about the stuff. He wants the people. That's what he wants. He's like, look, I want the people. You can keep all the goods. It's interesting, right after, right after a great victory, there's temptation for Abram. He gets to take all the goods. But it's interesting what he says. Abram says, listen, I have raised my hand. I have worshiped God, the God most high. And I, and I have said that I will not take anything, anything, lest you should say Abram, or, or I made Abram rich. I love this. Abram doesn't want what men can give him. He wants something greater. He, Abram does not want someone to say, this guy is blessed because I gave it to him. A lot of us want to be blessed the way men can give it. But it's interesting, the way Abram battles this temptation is because he's been worshiping. He's been worshiping, and that helps keep him from this moment of temptation. And it's fascinating because what Abram also says, he's like, look, all that I'm going to take is what the people have eaten and the portion of the men who went with me. So he's like, I only want the guys who went with me, the food that we already ate. But notice what he says in verse 24, let them take their portion. The end of verse 24 is fascinating because Abram says, look, I'm not going to take anything, but I can't make the decision for somebody else. We cannot force our faith on other people. And we cannot expect other people who don't believe as we do to live as we think they ought. And I think that it's very, it's very um, sensitive of Abram not to say, listen, well, none of us are keeping anything because I'm the ringleader here. He says, look, I'm not taking anything, but these guys have to choose for themselves. And that's an important distinction for us. We live in a day and age where there's some people who want to impose our religion on people. I think that that's an error. You, the, the Christian church historically has already tried to force people to convert. And we call that time in the church's history the dark ages for a reason. A relationship with Jesus is a personal choice inspired by the Holy Spirit, followed up by a willing spirit. And we can't make somebody believe. So if you're the kind of person, and listen, I know it's like I'm, you know, I'm a little, I can be a little pushy with people sometimes. Like I'm the kind of person when someone I know, like, listen, you got to stop resisting Jesus and just get right with the Lord right now. I mean, what are we waiting for? You know, that's, I like to talk to people I know that way. Be like, you know, you're just resisting the King of glory. You know what you're doing. Stop. But the reality is this. We can't force people to believe. We can only say, listen, there's a seat at the table waiting for you if you're willing to pull up to it. And you're going to make your own decisions. I can only encourage you to follow Jesus. Now, as we go into chapter 15, now we get into what is commonly called the Abrahamic covenant. Look at this. Verse 15, chapter 15, verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. But, Abram, but Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing that I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? Then Abram said, Look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to them, So said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he believed in the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. Now you can imagine this. Abram gets back. Everything settles down. And Abraham's sitting there and he's thinking to himself, man, I just defeated these five strong kings. They might come after me. And he might be thinking, darn, I gave up a lot of money. I mean, you, can, you guys know what that's like, right? Like you do something righteous and then you realize, 
what you just passed on as well. And you're, and you're kind of thinking to yourself, man, maybe I did it wrong. I mean, I could have, I could have used all those goods. But I love it. The Lord comes to him and says, don't be afraid. I love that. Those three words, I'm sure, are for somebody in here today. Just don't be afraid. Don't be, why? He says, I am your shield. He's saying, Abram, I'm your protector. Don't worry. And not only that, he says, I'm your exceedingly great reward. He's like, listen, my riches that moth and rust cannot destroy, that thieves cannot break it and steal, I am so much more valuable than anything you gave back to the king of Sodom. I love this. He's like, look, don't be afraid. I'm your shield. And don't worry about what you gave up. I am of way more value. I'm an exceedingly great reward. And then Abram, Abram's, he's struggling here because he's saying to himself, Lord, what will you give me seeing that I go childless and my house, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus saying, look, Lord, you promised me an heir. And right now, if I were to die, Eliezer of Damascus, who was my servant, he'd get everything. So he's saying, Lord, this is all great, but come on, God. Let's get this thing done. And I love what the Lord says in verse 3. Or excuse me, in verse 4. And the word of the Lord came to him saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. He's saying, look, you're going to have an offspring. Remember I said this last week. God, the people, and the land. Over and over and over again. Abram is getting reminded that he is going to have, there's going to be a people, and it's not going to be Eliezer or Damascus. It's going to be an offspring from his own body. And the Lord takes him outside in verse 5. He says, look up at the heavens. Count the stars. He says, so shall your descendants be. I love this. He's like, look up. Did you ever try and count the stars? Probably not since you were a kid, right? That's things that kids do. And you know what? We, we should start doing those things again. Jesus said we should be like children. You can't count the stars. There's just too many. He's like, Abram, that's how many descendants you're going to have. More, an innumerable multitude. And no, it's, look at how beautiful this is. Because chapter 15, verse 6 is actually the John 3, 16 of the Old Testament. Right here. And he, Abram, believed in the Lord and he accounted it to him for righteousness. Romans chapter 4, Galatians chapter 3, and James chapter 2 all bring this verse out. Essentially, there are two types of righteousness. One that is accomplished by our own efforts, which is right living, and one that is a gift bestowed by God. There are two types. Abram believed the Lord, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. So the idea here is what justified Abram was his faith in God. His belief in God. He believed in God's promise, even though it sounded absurd, and God accounted it to him as the gift of righteousness. This is the John 3, 16. You're going to find this coming over and over and over again in the New Testament about Abram, the father of faith. He believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And listen, I need to make this point because we live in a culture that says, I'm a good person, so eternity is mine. I call that spiritual entitlement. Because I am not as bad as the worst possible person I can think of, thus heaven is mine. We think God grades on a curve. And, 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 and then you have someone like Adolf Hitler or Jeffrey Dahmer or Charles Manson who, who cuts the curve really hard so that you're better than that person, thus you are righteous in the eyes of God. And the reality is this. The best person in here, the person in here who has made the least amount of mistakes is still radically in need of the righteousness that they cannot do on their own. That is the Christian gospel. The Christian gospel is not do better and God will accept you. It says God has accepted you because his son did perfectly in your place. God did for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. Jesus died the death that we deserved and he lived the life that we could never lead. And on that cross, he became us. And if we believe in him, he, we get robed in his righteousness. 
And the Christian gospel is not do better and God will accept you. It's God will accept you in Christ right now and then he will change you from the inside and the response of that change in your heart is you doing better. We don't change. We don't do good works to get saved. We do it because we're saved. Because God is changing our hearts, changing our motivation. That is the Christian message. And I know there's a lot of us in here today, you want to clean yourself up so that you're acceptable to God. And listen, you will never clean yourself up enough to be acceptable by God. If you're really honest, you change that action and your motives are all jacked up. And so are mine. I, if you're even remotely self-aware, you realize you do great things and your motives are all wrong. You, you help somebody in need and you look around, I wonder who's there to notice, right? You're really pious when someone is watching, but when nobody's around, the thoughts that pass through your mind are renegade, rebellious. The Christian gospel is this. Don't try and clean yourself up. You can't do it. Believe in the free gift of God, the person of Jesus Christ, dead and resurrected, and then the Holy Spirit will indwell you and change you from the inside out. That's the Christian message. That has been the good news of the love of God in Christ Jesus for us. Abram believed in God. He believed in what God had promised. He believed in what God was going to do, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. We are saved by grace through faith, not of works, lest anyone should boast. That's how Abram got it done. That's how people, for as long as humanity has been alive, has gotten it done. That is how God expects us to get it done. And what is faith? Faith is just the hand that received the free gift of God. If I walk up to you and I have a huge gift, and it's wrapped up, and it's got bows and everything on it, and I'm like, hey, this is for you. If you turn around and walk away, you don't get the gift, right? Even though I bought it for you, even though I wrapped it up for you, even though it looks great, it's there for you. Unless you reach out your hands and say, thank you very much, Pastor Daniel, that's mighty kind of you. Those hands that receive that gift, that's faith. The gift is Jesus. All we do is reach out our hands and say, thank you, God. That's how it happens. A gift with your name on it from the Almighty God. Will you simply reach out your hands and say, thank you. Thank you, God. And man, that's an, an awesome gift. Now, in verse 7, some strange things start to happen in this chapter. Because look what happens. Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? So he said to him, bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Then he brought all these to him and cut them in two down the middle and placed each piece opposite the other but he did not cut the birds in two. And when the vultures came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. Now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. Behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. Then he said to him, Abram, know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs. And they will serve them and they will afflict them for 400 years. And also the nation whom they serve, I will judge afterward. They shall come out with great possessions. Now as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried at a good old age, but in the fourth generation they shall return here, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. Now you think to yourself, huh? It's kind of a strange turn of events, right? See, what's going on here is this. Abram just got the promise about the offspring, that he's going to have as many as the land, and, or as many as the stars in the sky. And then God reminds him, not only are you going to have people, and I'm going to be your God, but you're going to get a land. He brings it up again, and Abram's like, Lord, how will I know? I mean, come on, Lord. You're saying you need to give me this land. And the Lord asks him for all these animals, a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Right? He asks for these offerings. And what does Abram do? He gets all these things, he brings them, and he cuts them in two down the middle and places them opposite each other. Just, right? We're all sitting there like, huh? Now, let me explain this to you. In those days, this was something that was called cutting the covenant. This was a very common practice 
back in Abraham's time. They would take animals and they would split the animals in half and they put them on each side. And then each of the parties would walk through it and agree to the terms of the covenant. The symbolism was plain that this covenant is so serious that it's sealed with blood. And if you break the covenant, let the same bloodshed be poured out on my animals and me. That's what it means. It was a symbolic act. Like, you, we think that's crazy. We are symbolic as we shake hands, right? The handshake agreement. You're making a covenant. In that culture, this is how they did it. So Abram gets the things. He, 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 he separates them. And what happens? God delays. Huh. Abram gets every, everything God wants is there. He's got all set up and God starts delaying. And the vultures start coming, right? They see these dead animals. They're thinking, mm-mm, buffet time. And the vulture, and Abram is shooing these vultures away. And as the night falls, then Abram gets completely terrified in a deep sleep. Now, I need to make a point here. Brothers and sisters, listen. God's delays... The problem is not with God's timing, it's with ours. God is the band leader. God sets the tempo, not us. See, it wasn't time. Why was God delaying? Because God wanted to explain something to Abram. He's saying, look, your descendants will inherit this land, but before that happens, they're going to go and serve in a strange land for 400 years. And then God's going to judge the nation. And then afterward, you shall come out with a great possession. What is God telling him? He's saying, look, before you possess the land, you guys are going to be in bondage in Egypt. The reason God delays is because God wants to give Abram more revelation, more than Abraham expects. He says, look, they are going to get this land, but before that, they're going to go into bondage. I'm going to judge that land with a great judgment. And this is all speaking about the book of Exodus. We'll see. Notice in verse 15, it says, Now as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried at a good old age. But in the fourth generation, they shall return here for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. Wow. Do you realize that the reason God had the children of Israel in bondage for 400 years was because he was waiting for the iniquity of the Amorites to be completed? That it wasn't just, it wasn't just about the deliverance of the children of Israel in Egypt. It was also about God wanting to judge the nation of the Amorites. And God was waiting. God knew that he was going to be long-suffering for a long time until this point. And then he delivers them out. So fascinating. God's delays is to give further revelation. They're not purposeless. So if you're waiting on God, rather than just waiting for the fulfillment of what you believe he's promised you, why don't you say, well, God, while you got me waiting, why don't you tell me what you're wanting to tell me? Let God's delays be fruitful, not frightful. Don't think, man, I think God forgot about me. No, maybe God wants to give you more revelation than you can even fathom by delaying. Now in verse 17, and it came to pass when the sun went down and it was dark, that behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between these pieces. Wow. As the sun goes down, now God shows up to cut the covenant. A smoking oven. You think about that smoke, it speaks of the, in church we normally say the Shekinah glory. If you were speaking Hebrew, it would be the Shekinah. In Hebrew, the accent's always on the last syllable. Okay? So we say Shekinah, because that's the way we speak English. In Hebrew, it's skina. That's the way they would say it. And it, that's the visible presence of God. When, when they prayed for the, the newly de uh, dedicated temple, smoke filled it. So these are these tangible presence of God. You think of the burning torch. You think of God as the refining fire. You think of Moses at the burning bush. God revealing himself in fire, consuming fire with Elijah. So God, and it says... Look what it says here, that this smoking oven is burning torch that passed between those pieces. It never says that Abram passed between the pieces. Why? Because this covenant's a one-way covenant. It's not predicated on Abram's faithfulness because God knew he couldn't be. 
This is all about God's faithfulness. And brothers and sisters, that's exactly what God did for us in Jesus. That's a one-way covenant. God knows we can't keep the terms of it. That's why he sent Jesus in our place. It's not if he's faithful or if we're faithful, then we're only going to get in because all of us know we're not faithful, right? The Bible even says, even when we are faithless, what? He is faithful. He cannot deny himself. And then it says, we'll close right here, verse 18. On the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying to your descendants, I had given this land from the rivers of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. Now we get the land from the great river, from the Nile, the river of Egypt, to the Euphrates. So from Egypt all the way over to Babylon. That's where the land is and the land of these 10 nations, the different ites, Kenites, Kenizzites, Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. I love this. God, the people in the land. God reminds Abram, he promises him about the people, and God reminds him about the land and makes him a promise about the land, and God keeps that covenant. Amen? Let's bow our hearts and pray. Father, we want to thank you so much for your faithfulness. God, we just confess that we are faithless so often. But Lord, you are faithful. You cannot deny yourself. And Father, we thank you that you make a covenant and you keep that covenant on our behalf. Lord, Jesus took care of everything. Your Holy Spirit seals everything. And all we do is we bring our broken selves and just simply say thank you by faith. And God, we want you to do all that you want to do in our lives. Let us learn from the life of Abram. Let us be admonished to live differently. And we ask it all in Jesus' name and all of God's family said, Amen.